Bible smack. All right, so I have uh, moved, got herself a crib, new home, great. And basically today I wanted to go ahead and um, do a lesson uh, dealing with the question of free will. And as I've developed this theology, Davidic Dispensationalism, I want to give the Davidic Dispensational view of free will. Now, generally, they really rank it, philosophers really break it down to either um, determinism, libertarian free will, or then they'll say, um, Maybe they're both at the same time compatibilism. Now, compatibilism sounds good, but it's really not going to really make them compatible. Um, I was pretty well down with it, and sometimes I do still feel different. So let me go ahead and I'll explain how Davidic dispensationalism looks at this. When we say determinism versus free will, okay, or libertarian free will, uh, the idea is either God is determined to all things and therefore he's determined your thoughts, or you've been created in a way to where you can freely make any decision regardless, and therefore you have libertarian freedom. Now, you know, coming from a tradition that believes in the sinful nature of man, it's kind of hard to argue that if man has a fallen nature that he's not somehow limited. Um, but, I am going to say that in some sense we have libertarian free will. Now, do you disagree? If you do disagree, are you disagreeing? Or did God give that thought to you? But if God gave that thought to you, is God disagreeing with me? Because God would have also given the thought to me. Is God disagreeing with himself? You see, the, the, there's a natural assumption of free will. Um... There's also a natural assumption that God is in control of all things. And there is a mystery that I go through, and I've already worked out a theology that kind of explains the free will and predestination debate. But what is free will when it comes to a human being? So, you know, by rationalizing, I've made a rational argument just now for free will, but um, I don't depend on those things because human logic is fallible. Because human people are fallible. So, um, the first question is, is there free will? Well, here's three proof texts. Okay. James chapter 1 And verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So, God does not tempt people to do evil things. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. And that was James 1.13. All right, Romans 6, verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye, that's you guys, yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Sorry, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Now, yielding yourselves and obeying is a volitional choice. So if you're obeying sin, 
then you're choosing sin. And if you are obeying righteousness, well, let me get what it is. Uh, yeah. Or of obedience unto righteousness, then you are choosing righteousness. And with the compatibilism, typically, the idea of depravity of man gets confused with the idea of inability and moral depravity. Man does have moral depravity, I'll explain that in a little bit. But, uh, inability, okay, is that necessarily what's going on? But the inability of the Calvinistic groups, uh, they say that man cannot do a good thing. Psalm 54, 6. Psalm 54, 6. I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. So this is a very powerful text. Why? Well, number one, David has not been what we call baptized in the Holy Ghost. Okay. In fact, when um, he's singing the Psalms, and this is the Old Testament, that's why. When he's singing the Psalms, he's saying, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Okay? Uh, he's not got the, the Holy Spirit dwelling in him like New Testament believers have. But, first it says, I will. Therefore, that would conclude that it is the will of David. I will freely sacrifice. There's that word, sacrifice. Okay? Um... Basically, you're doing a good thing in and of yourself. I will, without restraint, sacrifice unto God. Right. And this is scripture. So it's infallible. So infallibly, the will of David freely sacrificed unto God. And then he says, if I found it again, I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. So he has done something to do good. He did a good thing with his will. He freely did good will. Okay. Um, but let's go back up a second. What is that will? Okay. Is it a whale? Like free willy? <laughs> is it a um, contract? Is it the Fresh Prince of Bel Air? Not here. What it is, is it is the, um, the will, the desire of man. Um, and so when a fella puts his force into something and says, I will do this, then it is that desire for the action. And so that choice, okay, uh, the choice of the desire for the action. That'd be a good definition of the will. Now, Davidic dispensationalism is trichotomist. Okay. So, what that means is that the human has three compartments. It's a trichotomy. Body, soul, spirit. The body is your flesh. Now, the flesh includes not only your physical body but your physical brain your physical brain has hormones and therefore it inducts your passions and so when the by when the bible talks about your flesh and your fleshly desires they're very much your hormonal desires okay things that are not really uh based off of logic per se but they are your desires and your desires in the natural are self-centered desires. And so when you think in the flesh, you are thinking in a way that's self-centered and centered around you in a selfish, prideful manner. Now, um, the soul is typically understood as the mind, will, and emotions. Okay. While the spirit is your energy or your essence 
It could also be your subconscious, okay? And the spirit uh, has very close similarities to the soul, but there are distinctions. Let me uh, go over three key passages to kind of meditate on this. The first one is in Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord formed man of the dust, sorry, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So, the breath of life, okay, uh, this is the spirit, okay, in many different ways, the spirit is called life. Okay, so God breathes into him the breath of life, and he has his flesh formed from the dust. So you have a combination of the spirit meeting the flesh, and when the spirit meets the flesh, what is the back product? Man became a living soul. Let's go to First Corinthians. Chapter 15. Alright. This is, um, starting at verse, um, we'll go with verse 45. And so it is written, the first man. Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit was not um, that sorry. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord of heaven. Okay, so now let's look at uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And he says this in verse 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy now it doesn't mean holy with an h it means holy with a wh like as in the whole deal the whole shebang all right whole grain all right whole okay complete or whole and it says uh the god of peace sanctify you holy and i pray god your whole spirit once again that's a completion whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we have these three compartments that need to be worked on. But they say, well, maybe that was not in the full context. Well, let's check this out. There is a division of the soul and the spirit. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so there we have this thing. The word of God can divide these things, and it can divide the joints from the marrow, even though they're so closely connected. So the soul... And the spirit are very closely connected, but there is a division, there is a distinction. Okay. Now, um, the reformed idea is that man is born spiritually dead. Um, 
this is, you know, in the new Calvinism and stuff like that, this idea is pumped really hard. This idea that we're born spiritually dead. And they're like, okay, well, man is born spiritually dead, therefore. Okay. And you're like, oh, it's not kind of dead, it's dead, dead. All right. And so I'll bring up this passage. And I've done so on Facebook many times. And while I get um, a fleshly response, <laughs> uh, while I don't get a mental response, okay, um, negatives, boos, hisses, psst, <laughs> Nothing rational, okay? But um, the fact is that here's what the Apostle Paul says about life, okay? He says in Romans chapter 7, verse 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So he did have life. And then, when the law came, then he broke the law. Okay, there's a sequence of events. Sin came. Okay, then he died. But he was alive. Now, and this is a good backup point. Zechariah, I believe it's in verse, chapter 12. Okay. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Now, once again, the spirit is life. And it says there elsewhere in the scriptures, I'm just being lazy today, but you can find this. Okay. Um, basically, um, if God is putting the spirit into people, he's not putting it in to kill it. Okay. And in fact, why would God need to put a spirit inside a um, conceived child in the womb and then kill it because Adam made a fruit? How does that logically work? How does Adam doing something wrong make God kill a spirit that he puts in a baby? Okay. Why is God putting the spirit in the baby anyhow? So, you know, um, spirit is life. Okay. So God puts that living spirit and the baby is alive. The spirit has life. All right. But when the commandment comes, sin revives and they die. It's what we call an age of accountability. And I know Calvinists who do teach that, um, that all babies who die will uh, go and burn in hell because they are sinful and they're not spiritually alive, according to this teaching. But, you know, as we saw again, now... What's going on, though, is there is confusion in the nature of humanity. Now, I'll show you a source of this, and I'll show you where this makes 100% sense in my system, okay? It, it totally makes sense in my system, but they'll go and they'll, you know, go on a long train to Weirdsville. Was that cool when I said Weirdsville? Anyway. All right, so let's see here. Psalm 51. All right, for this is, um, I'll start verse 3 of Psalm 51. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, that's God, and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. That thou mayest be justified when thou speakest and be clear. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Okay, now, 
some people are trying to argue that, oh, well, she was committing adultery, and we have no evidence of that at all. Um, this is the sinful nature. But what is that? Okay. So they're going to say, well, you see, he had a sinful nature, therefore he was spiritually dead from the womb. Well, he had a flesh spiritual nature. Okay. He had a fleshly sinful nature. In fact, the sinful nature you might see in the NIV is translated literally as flesh. Sorry. So, the flesh is the sinful nature. Okay? But the flesh is not the spirit. Okay? A does not equal non-A. There's flesh and there's spirit. So, the flesh is sinful from the womb. We have a natural inclination to sin and do evil. The spirit is good. However, the spirit of man is extremely fragile. Now, what has to happen? Well, the will has to act. Okay? Now, I will describe the trichotomy like a courtroom. You have the judge, the district attorney, and the lawyer. The district attorney is your flesh and he's constantly tempting to sin and do evil. He's saying, judge do this, judge you gotta do that, judge you gotta do that. The judge is sitting there and he is the soul. And the soul is making the decisions and making the final word. Meanwhile, you have the spirit. What's the spirit doing? Spirit ain't doing nothing. Now, maybe the spirit is kind of like, ah, you're maybe he's talking in his sleep. Oh, oh. It's like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, the lawyer's here. He's saying something. But he ain't saying anything comprehensible. There's no point. So the spirit is basically dead. All right? The spirit is, um, what does it say, dead in trespasses. Okay, it's condemned. Now, the judge doesn't have to listen to the prosecutor at all times. He could say, you know what, you no, know, you sound stupid. I'm not listening to you. But remember something. That prosecutor, he's going at it. Every time court is in session, he's like, come on, come on, come on, come on. And while the lawyer In that environment, eventually, the judge is going to go along with the prosecutor, okay? Because there is that influence. The judge doesn't have to, but he is in that environment, okay, that is shifting, okay? And it's shifting the courtroom to death. That's what we have to face. The sinful nature is constantly tempting people. Now, what has to ha happen is that the judge has to have the authority to make his judgments. The will has to have enough maturity to reach that age of accountability. And so that mind has to be educated. And so when you have a child, and I've done youth ministry, and I've always kind of done it like this. When I look at a child of elementary age, I think of them as learning. They are absorbing, okay? You, you hear the term faith like a child. If you tell a child something and you don't look like you're lying, and you're just like, this is the way it is, they don't really have much to argue with you about. So they might believe it. Say, hey, behind this wall... 
There's a giant snake. It'll kill you. Giant snake? Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And they, they can't really argue. They're like, okay. Don't do it. You know, you get straight with them. Don't, don't believe childlike faith. Child does not have a free will because the child does not have an educated opinion. Then you hit the middle school age. This is what mom and dad have taught me. But what do I think? And the middle school age kid will develop that will. He'll develop his worldview and he'll say, well, this is what they said, but I think this is what the truth is. Yeah. High school, they're trying to find like that one um, uh, Michael W. Smith song. I'm trying to find my place in this world. I'm trying to fit in. And in college, AJ reevaluate. So now, as we're dealing with the will and age accountability, we see that the will takes time to develop. And as it develops, you got that prosecutor ready to pounce, 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 pounce with all that temptation and sin. And so they always fall into sin. But I will say this, though. Well, here we have to still understand what the, the spirit, what being spiritually alive is like. Being spiritually alive is making yourself open to spiritual things. And these are good spiritual things. Obviously, there are metaphysical evil spirits, the devil and the demons and so forth. But we think of spiritual things, we think of morals and, you know, uh, virtues, okay? Spiritual things. Now, there was a court case, and we know about in the government the idea of the separation of church and state. And this kind of is a good way of illustrating what the spiritual mind is like. When uh, our founding fathers settled the nation, the worldview of America was vastly a Protestant worldview, well over 90%. And with their Protestant worldview, they um, decided that they would follow the law of God and they would establish blue laws. Blue laws are Sunday Sabbatarian laws because they observe the Sabbath on Sunday. And so they would argue that the law should be arranged so that that could take place. Then uh, the government got away from spiritual things taking the prayer out of school, for instance. And once they started doing that, then they thought about it. And there was a case, I think it was Dover versus Maryland. Could be wrong, but I think that's what it was. And they basically said, look, all right, the blue laws, we'll let them in, but it has to be not for religious purposes. It has to be for secular reasons. And so they came up with some, like... Everybody's getting drunk on the weekend. We need them to have a day to sober up. Therefore, we have the blue laws. And that way they can get back to work on Monday and society runs smoothly. So now you have to have rationalizations for these religious things. Now, this is what the unregenerate man is like. They can do religious things but not for a religious purpose. They can do spiritual things, but not for a spiritual purpose. That is the unregenerate. Now, when a person is raised up in the faith of Christianity, they tend to develop a fear of God, but not necessarily do they have a instinct or a uh, 
they're not regenerate. In fact, some of them can get confused and never become regenerate. Why? Because they assume that their education was regeneration. But, on the other hand, they have a positive influence out of tradition. Uh, you practice godly things and you learn to fear God. And so there are many people who are not saved, but they've learned to practice godly things. And that's a good thing. It keeps you away from this atheistic mindset in an evil society. Okay? It's just that it has to be uh, tempered. Okay? It has to be controlled. Now, uh, the born-again spirit is a good thing. It is the one good thing in you if you are born again. If not, there is nothing good in you. And I'll probably leave off with this. But i got to find it. Uh, I guess I could just read till I get there. Let's see here. Okay, and the commandment which is ordained to life, I found to be death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me by that which is good that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would do, sorry, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is, it is mo no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would do not, but the evil which I would do not that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that then I would do good. Evil is present with me. For I delight in the law after the inward man. So the inward man, that is the spirit. Okay. And he says... Uh, but I see another law in my members warring against the law in my mind and bringing me into captivity into the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then the mind, so then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Let's see here. Alright, and so we see that the born again man has good in him, in his spirit, but there is no good in the flesh. However, there is a savior to the flesh, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Trust in him, and ye shall be saved and born again.